Okay, Sean again. And this lecture, we're going to talk about consequentialism. All right. So cons consequentialism is uh, that the right or wrong of an act is derived from the consequences of the act. So deciding whether a course of action is correct is about weighing up the consequences. If it causes net good, then it is a morally worthy act. And, and this good is sometimes called utility. So consequentialism is a synonym for utilitarianism. And I'll talk about consequentialism and utilitarianism uh, as a synonym in this presentation. So in simple terms, consequentialism is the greatest good for the greatest number. So we make decisions based around the greatest happiness or fulfilment for the greatest number of people. And this is actually a principle which is used a lot in healthcare and used a lot in society. Uh, now, because utilitarianism, consequentialism has a number of objections to it, which I'll show later on, consequentialists have a few versions of the theory. And a couple of the main ones are act consequentialism and rule consequentialism. So some consequentialists adhere to act consequentialism, where the utility or the good consequences of each act defines the moral worth of that act. But this means measuring each act for its utility. Now, some adhere to rule consequentialism, where the general rules of what works to increase happiness is used. So it's sort of kind of a blend between uh, deontology and consequentialism. An example of this would be vaccine mandates. So in general, vaccine mandates do the most good for the most people, even though we know that a very few people will have severe or even fatal reactions because of the mandates. So the good, though, is still to the greatest, greatest number, so utility is preserved. And this is one of the arguments used to morally justify vaccine mandates in the COVID pandemic. Let's go, go now through some uh, famous pros and cons of consequentialism. So the first is uh, one that you may have heard about. It's called the trolley problem. So I want you to think, I want you to imagine that you're in Melbourne. Um, you've got a part-time job as a tram driver. So the driver of a tram, um, first down the job and the tram, you're going down um, Swanson Street and the tram's brakes fail. And um, it keeps gathering speed as you're heading down the hill. And you see that you're heading to a group of five workers on the track in front of you. And they will certainly die if the tram keeps going. They can't hear you coming. But on the tram is a lever. And if you pull the lever, it throws the tracks, or throws the tram onto a separate track. All right. So the track will the tram will swap onto a separate line. And so it will avoid the five workers. Whew, no dilemma. Oh, but unfortunately, on the other line is another worker. And they can't hear you either because they're operating like a saw. And so they will certainly be killed if you switch the tracks. So this is where the dilemma lies. If you do nothing, five people will certainly be killed. If you pull the switch, avoiding those five people, they will be saved, but certainly one other person will be killed. So what is the morally correct thing to do? Okay, so this is actually a fairly complex philosophical question. And there's some great and not so great uh, articles and, and YouTube clips about it. But it's a worthwhile thought experiment because it helps clarify both consequentialism and also your own thinking around consequentialism. Now, there's there's no right or wrong answer with this. Um, and it's obviously a completely contrived example. But most people and all consequentialists would throw the switch. And from a consequentialist point of view, this is the obvious thing to do because um, you increase utility. You save five people, even though one person is killed. But is it still the correct thing to do? And I want you to vote now whether, whether it's correct or not. Now you've made a decision. Let's consider another thought experiment, which is pretty close to my heart because it's about health ethics. So this one actually is derived from the trolley problem. It's very similar. I want you to think that there are six people in hospital. All right. Um, one of them has liver failure, two of them have kidney failure, one has heart failure, and one has end-stage end respiratory failure from cystic fibrosis. And there's one other, so that's five, and there's one other who's completely healthy, and he's just in for a routine sinus operation. Now, the surgeon in the hospital is a consequentialist, and has just read the famous paper by Philip Foote on the trolley problem. So the surgeon decides to operate on the healthy person. And whilst the healthy person is under the anaesthetic, 
the surgeon removes both kidneys, uh, both lungs, the heart and the liver from the healthy person. In separate uh, operating theatres, these organs are then transplanted into the sick people and their lives are, all, are thereby saved. But in the act of saving those five lives, of course, the person um, that came in for the sinus operation dies. So we have saved five lives, but one person dies. What are you thinking about this situation? I mean, how is this actually any different to the trolley problem? Is it the same or is it different? Now that we've seen some of the uh, some of the limits to consequentialism, let's have a look at some more objections to it. All right, now you probably already thought of some of these when I went through uh, uh, when we went through consequentialism, but let's have a look at some at some more. Um, firstly, it's pretty unwieldy. I mean, how is it even possible to measure what is the greatest good for the greatest number without going forward in time and surveying everybody after the fact? It's a really imprecise theory. Uh, secondly, it's it's unclear who even should be accorded the utility. So it's those problems for justice. For example, in the case of an, an abortion dilemma, should the ut utility of the mother, father, or fetus be accorded um, the, the greatest happiness? Thirdly, as per the last question, it conflict, conflicts greatly with human rights. Um, and the example of the trolley problem, uh, or rather the, the, the surgeon problem, um, illustrates problems with human rights. Um, another instance is, is that motivation is not considered. So someone, I'll give an example of that. Someone could be intending to shoot someone with a rifle, but the last minute, the person ducks. So has that person that intended to kill the other person, even though nothing happened, there was no consequence, have they committed an evil act? Is motivation um, a moral harm? Well, not according to consequentialism. So in consequentialism, the person who accidentally shoots someone even through no fault of their own, is considered to have committed um, a moral harm as great as murder. All right, so that sums up most of what I want to talk about with utilitarianism slash consequentialism or teleological theory. And um, what we'll look at now is uh, virtue ethics, and then we'll look at principalism. Um, but just as a coda or, or an ending to this uh, presentation, um, if, you, if you want to, I've got one more thought experiment just to discuss, which is, I think, just a particularly interesting one, which shows, uh, I guess, some of the beauties of consequentialism as a way of living, maybe, or, or thinking, and also some of the, I don't know, the way it puts us in almost a, a straitjacket or, yeah, we, that we can't escape out of. So if you wish to, have it's not compulsory, have a, look, have a watch of that. It's about five minutes, I guess. And um, otherwise, I'll see you in virtue ethics. Cheers.